Welcome to the Inside Scoop Live podcast, where indie authors get personal about their books, their writing, and their passions. I'm your host, Sherry Hoyt. Join me for some lively conversations with debut indie authors and seasoned veterans alike. It's a great place to find your next amazing read or even get inspired. So sit back and enjoy the show and let me know what you think. Hey everyone, Mark Bello, author of the Zachary Blake legal thriller series, is back to talk with us today about his latest novel, Betrayal at the Border. Focusing on the overloaded and much headlined topic of immigration, Mark dives into dual cases in this book. Each one has a different angle on everything from immigration rules and regulations to debates to hardships and actual pain that is inflicted on those who are both documented and undocumented citizens of the United States. Before we get started, here's the inside scoop on Mark Bello. As an attorney and civil justice advocate, author Mark M. Bello draws upon over 40 years of courtroom experience in his Zachary Blake legal thriller series. A Michigan native, Mark received his B.A. in English Literature from Oakland University and his law degree from Thomas M. Cooley Law School. After working extremely high-profile legal cases, Mark wanted to give the public a front-row glimpse of what victims face when standing up for justice. Combining his legal experience and passion for justice with a creative writing style, Mark not only brings high-quality legal services to his clients, but captivating novels to his readers. When Mark's not writing legal and political novels, he writes and posts about fairness and justice in the civil justice system on his website, The Legal Examiner, and Not Fake News. In his spare time, Mark enjoys traveling and spending time with his family. Mark and his wife, Toby, have four children and eight grandchildren. To learn more about Mark Bello and his books, visit his website at markmbello.com. Well, hi, Mark. Welcome to Inside Scoop Live. Well, thank you, Sherry. Nice to be here. I mean, I should say welcome back. Yeah, I'm not welcome back everywhere, you know. (laughs) (laughs) You're always welcome back here. Uh, Thank you. Tell us about your latest book, Betrayal at the Border. Betrayal at the Border, as you know, is my seventh now Zachary Blake legal thriller. So that's kind of neat. Yeah. In my wildest imagination, I never would have thought that I'd write seven novels. But in this particular book, uh, Zachary Blake returns to tackle two more cases. Uh, And these cases exemplify our country's current contentious immigration debate. Mm -hmm. The story is set in Riverview, Michigan, which is a downriver community near Detroit. At least one story does. Uh, It features undocumented immigrants Miguel and Mary Carmen Gonzalez, uh, who are living, I I guess what you would call their version of the American dream. Mm -hmm. They've legally immigrated from Venezuela where there is political upheaval. They find jobs at a local plant. They've got two American-born children, Emma and Emilio, and they lead what I would call an all-American life. The problem is they've overstayed their visas for a variety of reasons, and ICE decides suddenly to raid their plant. So that's story number one. Okay. Story number two is naturalized citizens from Kobani, Syria, Kanan and Karim Azadi have immigrated legally. They have an American-born daughter, Hannah. And when they came to the country, they came alone. No family member would leave Syria for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Kanan's mother has been through hell, also known as the Civil War in Syria, at the border with Turkey. Mm. But hostilities have ended, and Kanan now wants to take Hana to the old country to meet her grandmother for the first time. Oh, okay. Yeah. The problem is that ISIS still roams around the country. The war is over. What could possibly go wrong, right? <laughs> in, in a Zachary Blake novel. <laughs> yeah, right? So what we have are two unique situations that involve America's dysfunctional immigration system, and that's where Zachary Blake enters the novel. So in this story, you're handling two cases, or Zachary Blake is handling two cases, which is different from your other novels. Is that right? That is true. And he's also kind of out of his element. 
for those of your listeners who aren't familiar with Zach, as you are, Sherry, he's mm-hmm. a rags to riches lawyer. He was down and out in the first book, Teetering on Alcoholism. He's resurrected his broken life and his career, and he's now the self-proclaimed king of justice in Detroit. Mm. These cases, however, he's a bit out of his element. He's not an immigration lawyer, but he developed an association in my second novel, Betrayal of Justice, with an attorney by the name of Marshall Mann. Marshall now has an associate by the name of Amy Fletcher, and the three lawyers now take on these cases, both the immigration case at the southern border and a terrorist network in Kobani, Syria. Okay. All of your thrillers are based on actual news headlines in the world today. What? There are so many issues in the world today. So what compelled you to write about the immigration issue right now? What compelled me to write about the immigration issue didn't happen overnight. It is one of those problems that has existed over a long period of time, have festered in my mind. Our government doesn't seem to be interested in fixing it. Mm -hmm. We can't get together on solutions. And it just ticks me off. I watched how people are being treated at the border, how politicized it is. And we seem to have forgotten who we are as Americans and where we came from. And I just consider it to be such an important issue about who we are as Americans and as the children of immigrants. One of the things that I frequently write about when I advocate on social media pages is, can you imagine what our country would look like today if our grandparents or our great-grandparents were treated like the people who are currently trying to get into the country at the southern border. Right. Well, we wouldn't be here, right? Uh, Well, uh, you know, we are all, except for Native Americans, children of immigrants. Mm -hmm. Of all the issues out there that irritate me, this one irritates me the most. And I Mm -hmm. always wanted to write about it, and I finally did. Wow. Wow. So when do you think this pushback uh, against immigration started? I mean, we are a land of immigrants, as you said. Well, I I think it's always been there. Mm. It's 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 not like it's easy to become an American citizen. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's a lot of strife in the world right now, particularly in South America, uh, political, economic, uh, humanitarian problems in these countries. And the citizens in those countries uh, look at America as a shining city on a hill, as, as Ronald Reagan called it. Mm. And they think if they come here, they're going to come here and realize the American dream, as perhaps they should. Mm -hmm. Uh, Keep in mind that when we talk about uh, immigration from uh, Southern American countries, typically, at least in the old days, they all came here to work in the farming industry. Mm -hmm. And they performed jobs that very few people wanted. We don't have an immigration problem if you've got an advanced degree, you're welcome here. Mm -hmm. What they don't want is a new class of welfare recipients. And while some of that might be true, uh, there still ought to be some way of solving the financial issues that relate to the kinds of things we're talking about. In the high tech sector, for instance, uh, H-1B visas are easy to obtain. Mm. But on the opposite end, if a non-skilled job is plentiful uh, and unfilled, why aren't we encouraging unskilled workers to come and take those jobs? We need those jobs performed. Uh, So those are the kinds of things I'm talking about. It's all political and all rhetoric, and it's a lot of baloney. And what we need is some serious people to tackle serious problems and come up with some serious solutions. Yeah, it doesn't seem like anything we do or maybe we're just not doing is the problem because nothing is working. And I feel like there's been inaction or horrible action on both sides of the political fence. Well, but think about it. Other than trying to manage the flow of immigrants coming in or out or being deported, 
what are we actually trying to do? Right. The tension centers are, are it's almost like, I, I don't want to compare it to Nazi Germany. Mm-hmm. Some people have. I don't think it's a fair comparison. But internment camps are essentially what we have. Yeah, that's crazy. And I don't think anybody's trying to get together and solve the problem. Some conservative legislatures, for instance, think that the solution is to end birthright citizenship for children of undocumented immigrants, Mm -hmm. which is a big story in my book. One of the reasons why the undocumented family from Venezuela, in my book, overstay their visa is because they have American-born children. Mm Mm-hmm. That makes them citizens. Yeah. Can you tell us about the differences in the two cases in your story? Well, first of all, both couples came to the United States legally. One went through the process and completed uh, the immigration process and became naturalized citizens. The other got a visa, got jobs, had children, and overstayed their visas. Why? Because they were afraid that if they went through the system and got declined, think about this, Mm -hmm. and got declined for citizenship, what would happen to them? They would get deported. If they got deported, they would have to make the painful choice of either leaving their children here with relatives or taking them back to a country that they have no familiarity with. Mm -hmm. That's a tough choice to have to make. So what they decided, rightly or wrongly, what they decided was, if we keep our mouth shut and our nose to the grindstone and we do our job and leave people alone, maybe they'll leave us alone. And that was great, and it worked for them until ICE raids their plant. Mm-hmm. So is that commonplace where their visa, a yes. visa will run out? and yes. they'll? But, but is it commonplace to apply for renewal and get denied? I can't answer that question. But they weren't willing to take the risk, A. And B, the question is, you're here. You've shown that you're a decent citizen. Mm -hmm. You're paying taxes. You've bought a house. You've had two kids in the country. Why is it so difficult to complete the process and become a citizen? Why do we make it so hard? Right. Especially when you consider that you have American-born children. If you have an American-born spouse, you automatically become a citizen. Why can't the same thing be true of American-born children? Right. That makes sense. Now, I don't have solutions to the problem necessarily, mm-hmm. but I, again, but, but I believe liberalizing immigration has to be a, a, an important component of a, of a workable long-term solution. Mm-hmm. So that's the undocumented side and what's happening around that. But your second case, going back to your book, Betrayal at the Border, your second case involves two naturalized citizens. How does right. how does this issue play out? Well, it isn't really an immigration story per se. Okay. It's more of a border story, for lack of a better way to say it. Mm. What I found fascinating and why I picked the two stories that I picked is because despite the fact that this family immigrated to our country legally, and obtain citizenship, their freedom to travel back and forth to their home country from their adopted country is restricted because America has terrible foreign policy relationships with certain Middle Eastern countries. Mm. And while the border between Syria and Turkey uh, is nothing like the border between America and Mexico, there's still a crisis nonetheless. Mm-hmm. And it's a crisis of hate, just like it is here. Mm-hmm. The Kurds, the Syrians, and the Turkish people do not like each other. And mm-hmm. for a long time, America supported the war effort on the side of the Kurds. Mm-hmm. And the Kurds were winning the war, and Kobani became essentially the country of the Kurds within the borders of Syria. So looking at what I call the betrayal at the border, which is why I titled it the way I did. Oh, okay. You can draw a a parallel between the two situations. There are different types of betrayal, but there's still this border crisis, just different types Mm -hmm. going on in both countries. 
Yeah. And that's kind of where I was coming from. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I get it now. I was wondering how the second one played into the immigration issue with the U.S. When I speak of dysfunctional, I speak both of the immigration situation and our foreign policy. Mm. Immigration's worse. Our foreign policy, I just wish we would stop trying to bend other countries to our will. Mm Mm-hmm. That's the failure in Vietnam. That's the failure in Afghanistan. We keep failing to learn the lessons of the past. Right. We're losing our popularity as a result, huh? That's true. I mean, maybe people aren't going to want to come to America anymore. I mean, I don't know. Well, that's essentially the Trumpian goal. Mm -hmm. He wanted to make it so uncomfortable for people to immigrate here that they would stop wanting to. And to some degree, he succeeded. The problem is there are very, very serious problems in the countries they're coming from. So in your career as an attorney, did you ever handle any immigration cases? I did not, which is why, by the way, Zachary doesn't handle these two cases. And we haven't really gotten to that. Yeah. Um, Zach, Zach is a civil trial lawyer. He writes wrongs for people in the civil justice system. So we have him in Betrayal of Faith, handling a clergy abuse case and taking on the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. In Betrayal of Justice, he takes on the President of the United States and the criminal justice system, and he helps a a young Muslim woman. In in a similar type situation to this, I created a fictional president who wanted to deport Muslims from the United States because of the bin Laden-type fundamentalist terror situation. Mm -hmm. And he was he's very Trumpian. Uh, A lot of people claim I did a hit job on Trump, but my response to that has always been, if you see a similarity between Trump and my guy, then that's on Trump, not on my guy. My guy came first. (laughs) Right. Um, Yeah. But this woman gets accused of murdering a white supremacist, and Ronald John, my president, wants to make an example of her. So if you want to talk about my immigration crusade, it goes all the way back to my second book. Wow. There's a talk about deporting all Muslims and Mexicans bringing drugs and crime and, and so on. And, and it starts there in, in book two, hmm. Betrayal of Justice. So Zach handles a criminal case and the civil case when she's exonerated, but he doesn't handle any immigration problem. That's handled by his now partner, Marshall Mann. Okay, that's where and he after, came in. Yeah. After Betrayal of Justice, he makes Mann the head of his immigration department, and Mann takes center stage in this novel and essentially handles the immigration aspects of the case, along with his top associate, Amy Fletcher. And the three of them not only take on the terrorist network, but they also take on the broken immigration system. Mm. And of course, your favorite character, Michael Love, returns slovenly and charming, as he always (laughs) was, to help the investigative aspects of the case as well. Nice. But if you consider how politically charged and anti-immigrant the country is, and especially how the immigration climate and international climate is depicted in the novel, you might say that their chances of fixing these issues are a Hail Mary at best. Mm. So So that that essentially sets up the the crisis. So Zachary Blake and Associates is really growing, huh? Oh, yeah. yeah. He's, (laughs) he's, He's quite the substantial legal hero compared to what he was in the first book, which was a TD ring on an alcoholic loser who got thrown out of a three-man law partnership mm-hmm. uh, and was out on the street with a, with a few cases until he gets a call from a woman whose two children were abused by a priest. And that case changes everything for him. Yeah. In Betrayal of Faith, my first novel. Well, I love the transition. So what kind of... You, he's, you know, quite the, he's quite the guy now. Yeah, he's he's all that, isn't he? <laughs> yep, yes, he is. Yes, he is. By the way, to continue these stories, what, what happens, and I'm not giving anything away, uh, but what happens is ICE raids the plant in Riverview and uh, sends the parents to a detention center. While the parents are in the detention center, they show up at the kid's school and haul them off to parts unknown, mm. not realizing that the kids are American citizens. Right. You can't 
lock up American-born children. So, so that's the problem. Where are the kids? How do we get the parents out of this detention center? That's the problem that confronts Marshall Mann, Amy Fletcher, and Zachary Blake in the southern border issue. Mm-hmm. In the Syrian conflict, Kanan and Hana arrive in Damascus. They're met by their driver, a friend of her husband's. And as they're driving from Damascus to Kobani, essentially across Syria, south to north, they're stopped by ISIS. And when ISIS finds out that this woman and her child are Americans, ISIS kidnaps them and holds them for hostage. Mm. So those are the two crises that Zach and his team must solve, and they race against the clock to do it. That's essentially what betrayal at the border is about. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot going on in the story, managing the two cases, and I'm interested in the research you did to fill the narrative. I did a lot of internet research, a lot of library research, and a lot of interviews with lawyers who I know in the immigration field to essentially, I took bits and pieces of various real cases out there Mm -hmm. and put them together uh, sort of like a mosaic or a puzzle yeah, uh, and wove them into these stories as best I could. I'm not going to sit here and say, if an immigration lawyer read the book and he might say, you got this wrong or that wrong. Uh, I didn't write an accurate legal account of the immigration system. I wrote a novel Uh, trying to show people what foreign-born citizens or non-citizens go through in dealing with these dysfunctional policies, both as to immigration and as to our relationships with other countries. Right. It is fiction at the end of the day. Correct. I'm not going to say it didn't matter to me. I like being legally accurate, Mm -hmm. but I also thought I could take some license, artistic license, fictional license, whatever whatever we want to call it, to make it a more compelling read. Yeah, absolutely. I doubt, for instance, very much that there's a whole lot of incarceration of American-born citizens going on, but it was a compelling storyline, and yeah. I wanted to make a point. Right, right. In this case, it didn't even ask, it didn't even dawn on them that they might be citizens. Ugh, that's horrible. They just came to the school and hauled them away. Can you imagine... I mean, I I know it's fiction, but can you imagine being a child and being (laughs) taken? Oh, my God. It's a mystery, legal thriller, horror story. Yep, it was. So I know it's early. Your book is available now for pre-order, and it comes out October 11th. So you obviously have had some initial feedback. What has the word been Uh, like so far? It's been very positive. Knock on wood, I haven't had a bad review. Whatever the highest amount of stars are from an editorial review standpoint, the book has achieved every time I've invited a review. Nice. Congratulations. So far, I'm very proud. Yeah, yeah. Of all my books, though, I I just think this is a really compelling read. I'm not knocking any of my previous six books. They're all excellent books, and I enjoy them. Uh, By the way, uh, one thing I would say to you is... I have to like my books. I have to sit back as a reader and say, as a reader of legal thrillers, Mm -hmm. I enjoy this book and I've enjoyed all of my books. But this one, I just think is a considering what's going on in the country and the political divide that's happening right now. It's such an important issue and, and it's just a very compelling discussion of what's going on out there. Yeah. The other thing I would say about the book at this moment is that I put it on pre-order for 99 cents. So if your listeners want to get a bargain on the book and pre-order it, it's going to go up in price on October 12th. Yeah, we'll put the link up in the show notes and listeners that hear this before October 11th can get Betrayal at the Border at the pre-order sales price. So do you feel like you really like this story most out of all of your stories because of the issue? It's been nagging at you for so long? I I guess the answer to that question, similar to Betrayal in Black. Betrayal in Black talks about cops shooting innocent black men and the Black Lives Matter movement. 
And I do believe that the plight of minorities in this country, particularly African-American citizens, Mm -hmm. affects a large segment of society, as does the stories in betrayal at the border. The two of those stand out to me as major crises in America Mm -hmm. versus the other novels, uh, Betrayal of Faith and Clergy Abuse, which is a terrible, terrible issue. No, don't get me wrong, but what percentage of people does the issue affect? What class of people, what group of people? Uh, It's child abuse. Child abuse is a huge problem. But when you're looking at issues that affect mass amounts of people, it would be those two. Hmm. Maybe I'm wrong about this, but that's kind of how I look at it. Supreme Betrayal, for instance, took on the Me Too movement and how women are treated by people in power over them, whether it's political or in business. But women have a lot of power in this country. Poor immigrants have no power in this country. Or black citizens in police encounters have very little power in those situations. Mm -hmm. So I guess there are stories of the powerless versus the powerful, and I'm drawn to those kinds of issues. Yeah. Boy, my husband and I took a road trip to Colorado about a month ago. Well, no, I guess it was back in July now. So, And we drove by way of El Paso, so we did go through border check. Um, Yeah. And I am as white as they can be. You know, I'm I'm a snow white <laughs> person. I'm. They had the dogs. <laughs> they had the 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 uniform guards, the dogs, everything. They everybody had to stop. And here I am, snow white, and I'm nervous. I'm like, what am I nervous about? So I can't imagine what people go through. I just thought of that funny story. I'm not sure why, but it's not funny. But it's legal, funny. Legal, yeah. legal or illegal, Sherry? You still feel that way? Oh, right, right. Think about, for instance. A Jewish immigrant in the 1940s and 50s who are lined up for some kind of government-sponsored necessity from the experience they just had five, six years ago. Mm -hmm. This is what so-called brown people are going through at the southern border, whether you're legal or illegal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's scary. They, They create this fear, this feeling of guilt that you're doing something wrong when you're not. Maybe I'm just super sensitive, but I get that way whenever I see a cop car on the road, even if I'm doing the speed limit same, and, you know. <laughs> same, thing, same same experience, but that's a good example. Yeah. A cop drives by and you just get this twinge, right? Right. Am I going the speed limit? Go, just go through a yellow light in front of him? Yeah. Yeah. Fear factor works. Now think about it from the standpoint of a person of color. Mm-hmm. The cop drives by you. Maybe he does a U-turn. Oh, uh-huh. no. Is he after me? Scary. The so-called talk that a, that a father has for a son in that community. It's terrible. Mm-hmm. So I, my heart goes out to people who are put in those situations. Maybe it's that my grandparents and great-grandparents came from Russia and Poland and the type of oppression that existed between the 1920s and the 1940s in Eastern Europe. I, I don't know, but I, I just have a special bond with people who are treated in that fashion. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned earlier, we might've been off the record actually, but you mentioned earlier about your advocacy job. What do you do um, when you're not writing? Well, well, it isn't so much my advocacy job. I do legal and political advocacy to promote my books. Okay. If I see an injustice, I like to write about it. It doesn't necessarily have to be a book. It might be an article. Oh, okay. Yeah. So right now in Michigan, what's going on is they took our 40-year-old no-fault law, 45-year-old no-fault law in an automobile, and changed the law. And it threw catastrophically injured people out of a system that protects them financially. Oh, no. It just completely eliminated their safety net. Hmm. And I don't think the legislature even considered when they made the changes that it would do the things that it's doing. So... I've been railing on these changes that took effect in July of this year on social media. I've been railing on issues of immigration on social media 
first, because I think the system is broken, and second, because I wrote this book and I want to promote it. Right. But that's what I mean by advocacy on social media. Okay. Now, in addition to writing legal thrillers, you also co-host a talk show. And do you want to tell us a little bit about your show? The show is called Justice Counts, and it obviously is about justice and legal issues relating to justice, like immigration, by the way. The latest episode has me interviewing a terrific lady by the name of Tamina Watson, who is an immigration lawyer. Hmm. So I encourage you to listen to that interview if you like the topic. But in addition to that, and the reason I call it Justice Counts is because Justice is not just a legal term. It's a term of equity and inequity. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, if you apply for a mortgage, what did you call yourself when you were at the border? You're the whitest white person? Um, (laughs) The whitest white person there is. (laughs) Okay. So if you're Snow White, you have a better chance of getting a mortgage than you do if you're black or brown. It's an injustice. Right. It's unrelated to anything other than the color of your skin, assuming that the person who is applying is otherwise economically qualified. Mm -hmm. Now let's make it worse and say that the person is seeking to purchase a house in an area that there are very few minorities. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the reason he's being declined is because he's a minority. Mm -hmm. Redlining. So exactly. And that applies to insurance that applies to goods and services. If you shop at an inner city market, you're going to pay higher prices for food and drink than you do in a suburban grocery store. Yet those people have less money. So injustice applies beyond the law. And what I'm seeking to do is talk about legal issues as well as socioeconomic injustice issues in addition to how justice plays out in the legal system. Yeah. Another example, I was talking to somebody, I'm trying to get them on my show. They live near a power line, and they've been trying to get the power line moved. Why do they live near a power line? Because they had no power, pun intended, to prevent the line from going through their city, because they were a city of lower economic circumstance. Hmm. That's where these things go. Airports are are located uh, near poorer neighborhoods. Yeah. I never thought about that before. Wow. So those are the kinds of things I'm talking about. Well, that sounds really interesting. That's what what justice counts is. That's what I hope justice counts to be. I just interviewed uh, two lawyers who handled the bulk of the Larry Nassar Mm. case and got justice for all of those Michigan women. And that's a really compelling episode. I'm so proud of them. They went to the same law school I did. Oh, wow. And they basically took on the Olympic Goliath, Mm -hmm. and Michigan State University, and now they're working on the Robert Anderson cases at the University of Michigan. So, yeah, it's it's good stuff. I'm enjoying myself. Yeah. Oh, that's fun. Probably get a lot more inspiration for more stories, too. (laughs) Yep. Looks like you're also venturing out into other genres. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the other things you've been working on lately? Well, surprisingly, I, I just finished writing a Jewish recipe cookbook. Oh, wow. And what I basically did, this is kind of cute. I basically (laughs) took my own family's recipes, some of which are 140 years old, and I wrote them as if they were Zachary Blake's old family's recipes. Oh, wow. And it's called La Dorvador 2. You're familiar with my novella. Yes. Uh About the Holocaust. And I wrote La Dorvador 2, the Blake Lewin family cookbook. And it has a bunch of Jewish recipes in it, like chicken noodle soup or chicken matzo ball soup and kreplach and kogel and brisket and wow, you, you, you name it. Uh, Homantashen, if you're familiar. <laughs> I'm not, but uh, it sounds good. <laughs> um, there's obviously sweet tooth stuff and, you know, dinner and, and holiday stuff. Mm. So, and I add a little bit of Zachary Blake's sense of humor and his interaction with his aunts and great aunts and uncles and great uncles and parents and grandparents. And I put little tidbits in the book about how he got along with this person and that person, 
what makes this person tick and that person tick. Uh And essentially, family members of mine will recognize themselves, if they read the books, as real people. Oh, wow. They aren't depicted as real people, but a a dirty little secret, some of these recipes and and these people are real. (laughs) So I I had a good time creating the the book, and it's a lot of fun. It's not just a recipe book. It's a, it's kind of a Zachary Blake romp through history, if you will. Yeah. Oh, that sounds fun. Yeah. I want to read that one. And I'm, I'm hoping to get it out for the holidays. Mm-hmm. And then I've, I've decided that these issues are important enough uh, to be told to children. <gasps> yeah. And safety and social justice, I believe, are introduced to kids at too late an age. So I've written so far three. They're being illustrated by a wonderful children's book writer and illustrator by the name of Melinda Faugust, and her art is beautiful. So I'm awaiting the completion of the illustrations. Uh, The books are stories in verse, and the topic so far are bullying, interracial bullying. A biracial child is bullied by the white kids in school when he moves from his neighborhood to a, an all-white neighborhood. Mm. The smallest kid in the class and how the smallest kid in the class is kitted, if you will. A little less serious issue than racial bullying might be, but right. bullying nonetheless. Right, right. And then the third is distracted driving and, and what a child should do when he sees his mother or father in the front seat doing something while they're driving that they shouldn't be doing, like talking on the phone, texting, putting on makeup, Mm -hmm. and so on. Oh, wow. These messages are delivered to kids at driver's training, let's say. You know, don't do this. Drive this way, not that way. Yeah. I believe that we ought to catch them much earlier, and that's what this book attempts to do. What I hope to do with, with that book is do Zoom visits to schools and what have you, and essentially lecture about the dangers of these issues. Yeah. So now do you have consistent characters in these stories or are they different with each story? They are different with each story. Nice. There's going to be a consistent, let's call them superhero, a fictional animated character who is prevalent in each book to introduce the story. Nice. Yeah. The books are cute and they're fun. Yeah. And they're important. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Mark, thank you so much for stopping by today and visiting with us and sharing a little bit about what you have going on. My pleasure, Sherry. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining me today for my interview with Mark Bellow, author of Betrayal at the Border. To learn more about Mark and his books, visit his website at markmbello.com. And be sure to check out our other interviews at InsideScoopLive.com.